morning we're going to continue looking at Joshua. And uh, in that book of Joshua, we, we find we find again here that there's times that even when people are, are on track with God, there's times that we can have struggles. There's times that we can get into trouble, even we can get into difficulties, and uh, and we can lose track of where where it is God wants us to to be at that, at that time. The people of Israel, as you know, have been um, doing things a little bit uh, different. Different. They they've uh, gone through struggles. They got on off on their own direction, and then we see them also that they get back on track. They get their relationship right with God and recommit themselves to follow after God. But again, that we, after the defeat of the people of Ai, we see that they, there's a little bit of a swing, but it's because of a different problem. You know, I, I don't know if you realize, there's people in the world, and even in the church, that might want to see you at times. They see you as an easy mark. They want to get you off track. And I also believe Satan is willing to use whatever means he might in order to pull you off track where you need to be in your walk with God. And in this case, this morning, what we're going to see is that that, that actually happens to the people of Israel, Israel as well. It may seem very innocent at first, and it may even seem like the right thing to do, but on closer examination, we will find that it may, it may not have been what was right in the first place. Many of us think that it's right because you get a gut feeling. You ever get a gut feeling and say, you ever use that? My gut feels like this is a good idea. In my gut, I think, you know, you, you know in, in my heart, I think that this is how I should go. And, and we, we take that feelings of how we, how, of what seems right, and we, we often follow after that when we really should be doing it, going about things that are maybe different. people of Israel found themselves in this situation. So we know what we see here in this passage of Scripture in Joshua chapter 9, we find that they've defeated the people of Ai, and, and the news travels around to the peoples all around them, and they, they get a little worried. So we see some nations banding together, beginning, beginning, beginning to put themselves into alliances in order to be able to maybe defeat these strong people of Israel. But then there's another group that we find in this passage of Scripture that find themselves doing something a little differently. Now they're afraid that they're going to be taken over. They're afraid that they're going to be crushed and they're going to be killed and they're going to, be, they're going to lose. And so comes the deception. And deception comes from many places, but in chapter 9, verse 3 through 6, we see an interesting deception. It says, When the inhabitants of Gideon heard that jo what Joshua had done to Jericho and I, they, they acted deceitfully, deceptively rather. They gathered provision and, and took worn out sacks of, on, their, on their donkeys, and old wineskins, cracked and mended. They wore old patched sandals on their feet and threadbare clothes clothing on their, on their bodies. The entire provision of bread was dry and crumbly. They went to Joshua in the camp of Gilead and said to him and the men of Israel, We have come from a distant land. Please make a treaty with us. Now you see, things are not always what they seem. The people of Gibeon knew that they could, could not defeat the people of Israel. Although other kings were making these alliances that we, that we hear of in this passage of Scripture, in this, in this book, in this chapter of God's Word, the Gibeonites developed a soul plan in verse 1. With old clothes and old wineskins and moldy bread, they sought to convince Joshua that they were from a faraway land and, and had been led to Israel as a result of hearing great things that is of Israel's God. So they come and they, they, they you know, they, they get this huge idea. It's like, well, we don't want to be destroyed. We don't want to lose out. So let's go and we'll deceive. We'll, we'll, we'll be a little deceptive. We'll, we'll get a plan together. We'll go and see if we can make a treaty with the people of Israel. And then we'll, we'll maybe be able to survive and we'll be able to make it. The problem was, God had told Joshua not to make an alliance with anyone. They were not to align themselves with non-Israelites. 
Now, the lesson that, that for us in this is that, that the devil is deceptive. And will use anything that he can to convince God's people to compromise. You know, Satan is said to be a sly and, a sly and seeks to sneak up on non-believers. He uses subtle ways to draw us away from God. For example, Christians need to remember that, that Satan will probably not try to get us to deny the whole Bible. Now, that would be silly, wouldn't it, of him? Satan doesn't want us to deny God's Word completely. He would rather us to go slowly and take little bits and pieces and, and say, well, that, you know, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure about this little bit. I'm not sure about that little bit. And, and slowly and slowly, we begin to move away from what God's Word would have us do. So he entices us to compromise in small ways. He tempts us to keep a little corner of our lives to our, for ourselves. And say, you know, well, you know, I give myself all over to the church. I, I do all kinds of things for God. But yet, I have this little part, I'm going to keep this little bit for myself. And we begin to compromise. Maybe it's the style of music that you like to listen to. And you know, I love lots of different kinds of music. If you ask Madeline, Madeline and I, are, and Alexander actually said pretty similar too. We, we like lots of different music. Well, I like to listen to classical sometimes. I like to listen to, uh, I'll listen to, uh, I'll do this the, look at the radio station that I have on my car. 103.9, country. 105.9, Christian. Uh, 102.3, which is kind of a weird variety. They just play all kinds of stuff. 102.9, sonic. You know, I like to listen to lots of different music. And occasionally, even I'll put on CBC, but it's not tuned in. But, I, but you know, I, so I like a variety. But there, I know that there is some music, and I know that some of the young people in our church, and they're probably uh, in the, around uh, uh, you and your friends, listen, there's some of the music that you listen to is you should not be listening to. I'll just straight up tell you. The words and lyrics are horrible. Madeline and I were listening to a song, and I said, this is really catchy, I really like the song, I can't remember what song it was, but then she said, yeah, dad, yeah, you not listen to the lyrics, and it was really good, because one of her classes challenged her, her music teacher, the choir teacher, challenged them to listen to the lyrics and try to understand the lyrics of what they're, what they're talking about. So I challenge you, be careful, to where you compromise it. Maybe it's, you like movies, and you compromise on which movies you watch. Well, there's only a little scene that is really wicked. Or maybe it's other things that you know, I, you know, you feel in the blank. Compromise. Satan gets us to compromise and slowly take in little areas of our lives and say, oh, this is okay. I, I'll just follow after this. He deceives us to follow after him and then gets us off track of where God would have us do. That's what we see happening with the people of Israel here. They get a big they come to Joshua, and Joshua's been told not to make an alliance with anybody. Yet he comes and he sees these people, they're, they look poor, their clothes are tattered, their food is moldy, they have old wineskins, beat up wineskins, and, you know, and their sandals are worn out. So, so, so Joshua goes, okay, come with me. There's a little bit of a problem there we're going to get to, but in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, it says, Be serious, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for anyone he can devour. Resist him, and be firm in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are being experienced by your fellow believers throughout the world. In other words, you're not alone. God knows that you're not alone. But you need to be careful, because Satan is wandering around, looking for how he might pull you away from, from the relationship that desire, God desires to have. You see, it's not the, the weak Christians that say he worries about, it's the strong Christians. So it's the strong Christians. He's coming after, he's prowling after you, he's looking for you, trying to deceive you, trying to get you off track so that you can become weakened in your faith and in your, in your walk with God. We need to secondly be prepared. First, we see how deception comes from all places, way, all over the place, but secondly, we need to understand that we need to be prepared to do what is right. Joshua chapter 9, verse 14 and 15, we read this. It says, Then the men of Israel took some of the provisions, but did not seek the Lord's counsel. Wow. There's a big problem there, isn't there? Verse 15 says, So Joshua established peace with them, 
and made a treaty to let them live. And the leaders of the community swore an oath to them. Joshua and the leaders fail to do what is right. We need to prepare ourselves to be ready to, to, to encounter, when we encounter deception. And how do we encounter it? Well, the answer is in verse 14 there, when, when uh, it tells us there that the men of Israel took some of their provisions but did not seek, did not seek the Lord's counsel. Joshua did not seek the counsel of God and thus failed to see the truth. It seems that to be an obvious omission, but how easily it is when we fail to fall into this trap. We often get so busy we forget to call, God, call on God, and before we know it, we're where we should not be. Paul reminds us that the devil blinds people's eyes to their need for the gospel. But he also blinds believers, I, believe, I think, keeping them from turning their eyes to God. For 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, we read this, Therefore, since we have this ministry, because we are shown, we have shown, we're shown mercy, we do not give up. Instead, we have renounced shameful secret things, not walking in deceit or distorting God's message, but commending ourselves to every person's conscience in God's sight by an open display of the truth. But if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this age has, was, has blinded the minds of, un, of the unbelievers. So they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Who is this image of God? For we are not proclaiming ourselves about Jesus Christ as Lord. And ourselves as slaves because of Jesus. For God, for God who said, let the light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give light of knowledge of the glory of, God, of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. What we see happen in this passage is when we as believers compromise in our faith, when we as believers are not in a right relationship with God, it affects those around us, it affects our ability to be able to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ in the lost world around us. It's in the way of us having a good, strong witness for those around us. It, it, it affects our testimony. Now, I'm not talking about our proclaimed testimony. It affects also our, not only our proclaimed testimony, it also affects our living testimony. When our lives are, are, are not where they should be, when, our, when we're walking in places where we're not, we're not called to, it changes our ability to be able to proclaim God's good news to those around us. We never arrive at the place where we need, where we do not need to read the Bible. We never arrive at the place where we do not need to spend time in prayer and commune with God. You see, this devil seemingly tries to, to blind us, most of, most of us, when we're trying our hardest. He gets us off track for just a day, and that, that day turns into a week, and that week turns into a month, and that month into a year. I have a brother, I have a brother-in-law and sister who were so strong in our church. In fact, they were, as, a, as my oldest sister, who was a great example in our family, and as we were growing up, she was amazing. She sang, led worship, she played the piano. She did anything that was required of us. She, she, she led in Sunday school. She, she taught uh, children. She, she was a great example. She, she was the one who put our, what we call the Dover part of the time, the Good News Club together. It was a Wednesday night, and we had, from the community, we had over 100 children that would come on Wednesday night to hear God, God's Word, and to, to, to worship, and, to, and just to, to learn about who He was. And then one day, Satan got her attention by, by, by getting her to see, and, and her husband to see that there was a problem in the church. And that problem was, was not a great problem. And, and as a result, they began to sort of slide away from the church. And that one, sun, one, one Sunday, they began to, to, uh, to go do other things. Their sons, they had five boys, all involved in sports. And then one Sunday, they began to... The, the, because with five boys, it's pretty hard not to, to go do the things on Sunday. And
And they thought, well, since the church isn't all that concerned about us, I think Satan's deception of them for them was that the, the church didn't care anymore. And as a result, they began to move away from the church more and more. And slowly, eventually, it became one, not one week, it became a month that they were away. And then that month turned into a year, and that year has now turned into probably about 20 years. But they've not really stayed committed to the church. Satan's deception. Seems so little at the time. That compromise was just so tiny at the time. And now, not only that, the husband, my sister and her husband don't attend church. None of her boys attend church. Until this reason. When one of her sons and his fiance went on a retreat, and God got their attention back. Say you're attending church. And now, from his example, the mother, my, my sister and her husband are starting to attend as well. But it's so hard to get back. But it's so easy to get off. And I would encourage you, I mean, you know, to just to think through this, to think through what God has placed in front of your life and what God is desiring from you. Now, not all things are bad, not all things are terrible. And I love, I love to go help people, I love to go do things like that. And, in this case, I'm sure Joshua's intentions were good. He sees, he sees people with, with no with, with clothes that are, are grumpy and clothes that are worn out. He sees he sees clothes that uh, he sees people with with no food, and he sees people that don't have a decent pair of shoes to wear. He's, you know, he, his intentions were good. And you see, God can take those those things, and, and we need to seek, ask God what direction He wants us to go. Maybe it, God would have told him, "Oh, help these people." Maybe God has some place for you to go. Maybe God has something that for you to do. But we need to make sure that it's, that's where we need to be. See, it's, it's that easy. Before we know, we're walking so far away from God that we think that we don't need Him or we compromise, begin to compromise on what we believe. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 23, we read this. If indeed you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith, and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you heard. This gospel has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and I, Paul, have become a servant of it. He says, if you indeed remain grounded and steadfast, stay strong, stay committed, you will get on track. But what if you are on track? What if, what if you've gone, you know that you've gone and compromised, and you know that, that you need to move back and shift back? What do you do now? What do you do if you've been deceived or if you've been off track? In Joshua chapter 9, verse 19-23, through we read this. It says, All the leaders answered, We have sworn an oath to them by, by the Lord, the God of Israel, and now we cannot touch them. This is how we will treat them. We will let them live, so that no wrath will fall on us because of the oath that we swore to them. They also said, let them, let them live. So, we, so the Gibeonites became woodcutters and water carriers for the whole community, as, leaders, as the leaders had promised them. Verse 22 says, Joshua summoned the Gibeonites and said to them, Why did you deceive us by telling you were, us you were from far away from us? When in fact you live among us. Therefore you were cursed and will, be, will be, always be slaves, woodcutters and water carriers, for the house of my God. Sometimes, we do make errors. And we learn from, the, from Israel that we cannot just walk away. Satan may seem to be painting you into a corner, or so it seems, and, but here we see that people have integrity. They have, they, what they have, uh, have to live by their mistakes, but Satan did not win. They were able to honor God's state. When we walk into a place where we don't meet, where we don't belong, we need not to forget this example of what we found here, we find here in the people of Israel. We may live with the mistakes, but but that does not mean that we cannot be drawn, cannot draw back into a right relationship with God. Even though Joshua and the Israelites entered into a bad alliance, they kept their oath. Two wrongs would not make a right in this case, right? In the grace of God, in the grace of God, the Gibeonites were made wood and water carriers for the rest of their days. 
See, what I'm getting from this, what I understand from this, is sometimes we do get in, do things that we shouldn't be doing. But we need to take those off those times, those off those places, and turn them around for the good of God. A couple of years ago, when we were we went to Promise Keepers, and I my friend was preaching, but before my friend got up to preach at Promise Keepers, we actually had uh, a guy get up and speak about his life in pornography. And it was a very interesting discussion because what he had to say sort of fits into what we see here. Because what I believe pornography really does for men, typically, is that it, it begins us to get us to compromise in just little places. And slowly that becomes so large it gets us into it's in the place where we can't be. But what he did was he turned his life around. Satan got him to compromise in his life. This man who was a deacon in the church, this man who was a leader in the church. And how he turned his life around and honor God is he's taking his error, his mistake, and is proclaiming to other men around the world how he needs, how they need to be careful and not be caught up in the same way. Very similar idea that we see here. We get down that slippery slope. We get, that, get into that deception. We, we, we do get deceived. And so what we see happening is that God is able to draw us back by us remaining in our integrity. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 6 says, Be better, to be better a poor man who lives with integrity than a rich man who distorts right from wrong and wrong. Even in the face of deception, you and I need to live with integrity. When you, when you, when you learn that you've gone wrong, or that you have been wrong, now is the time to do what is right. Today I want to take you, what I want you to do is to take from this sermon two things, and that is the best way to keep on track is to avoid deception by, by, by the devil. And we do that by seeking guidance of God through prayer and, and knowing His Word. But if you also, though, if you do find yourself off track and deceived by the deceiver who is Satan. Remember the example of the people of God. Live with integrity and honor God. Live with integrity and honor God. If you can do these things, there's no way that Satan can. So, prayer, pray and know His Word, and live with integrity and show God in the world that you honor God, even when you make mistakes. You see, because I know I make mistakes. I know that I've probably, in, in, this, in almost three to years that I've been here at this church, I've probably offended one or two of you, and I make mistakes. But I want you to know that's not my intention. Never is my intention. I want to honor you, honor God by, by living with integrity. And be honest. So when I fail, that's not the time to hide. It's the time to be, be honest. When you fail, that's not the time to hide. But be honest. Live with integrity.